Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for tonight's SIF 45 Streams Happy Hour, which is sponsored by Great Lakes Brewing Company. I'm Mallory Martin. I'm the Artistic Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put down your phone during this happy hour and consider replacing it with a fresh Great Lakes beer. I'd like to introduce Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center who will be interpreting for us during the first half of our program tonight. Thank you for being here again with us tonight, Kelly. Uh, I want to know, um, or sorry, do you guys want to know which films are buzzing at SIF? Uh, then head on over to our SIF 45 Streams virtual lobby presented by Pierre's Ice Cream. You can get to the link from the homepage of the SIF website, clevelandfilm.org, or in the description below on the YouTube page. This is a chat-based platform for all things SIF, uh, where you can talk with filmmakers, staff, including me, and other audience members about film recommendations and learn about all the Q&As and events coming up during the second half of the festival. So make sure to join us on Discord and act like we're in the SIF lobby again together. Another great chance to engage directly with filmmakers is on these, our live happy hour shows, in which our filmmakers and guests answer your questions about their films. If you're watching live and would like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature over on the right-hand side. Our moderators will ask selected questions to the filmmakers and guests. On today's happy hour, we'll be joined by guests from the films Rebel Hearts and Woman is Losers. And now we'll start our first segment led by Chris Shank from the Congregation of St. Joseph and Future Church. Hi, Chris. Yeah. Hi, Mallory. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be um, moderating this really wonderful film about a community that I've admired for years and years and years. I'm the um, uh, co-founder and founding director of Future Church, which is a Catholic church renewal organization in Cleveland, centered in Cleveland, but actually we're all over the world now. I'm an emerita, however. I'm also a board member for River's Edge, which is the sponsored ministry of my own religious community, the Congregation of St. Joseph. So um, I'm also an author and I've really spent the last five years of my retirement working on one book about the archeologic evidence of women leaders in early Christianity and another one about Teresa Kane who asked the Pope to open all the ministries of the church to women nine years after the IHMs did their thing on behalf of women in the church. So um, anyway, I, I love the idea of telling the stories of courageous, brave women. And so with that, I want to, it's my great honor to introduce um, Pedro Koss, who's the director and editor of Rebel Hearts, as well as Lenore Dowling, who is a member of the IHM community who lived through this in incredible time and is a subject of the film. So I'll, um, turn to some questions I had, if it's okay. Um, I guess my, my first one is for Pedro is, well, first I just wanna thank you for just an incredibly inspiring documentary that preserves an extremely important period of history of the women's movement in not only the United States, I would say worldwide. It's been my, observe, my thought for a long time that if you wanna look at the history of the women's movement, look at the history of women's religious communities. And so, but so often we don't know their stories. So my question for you is, um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about what led you to invest so much of your own time, energy and resources in making this film? I mean, how did this get going for you as an important thing in your life? <laughs> Absolutely. It's been an honor of a life. And first of all, I want to thank uh, you, Chris. Uh, it's such an honor to be here and at the, and having Rebel Hearts be a part of the Cleveland International Film Festival. It's, uh, we're really excited. Wish we could be there in person, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully um, an another, another point in the near future. But, um, you know, the, the origin story of Rebel Hearts and actually how it came uh, how I was lucky enough to, you know, uh, to be on its uh, path is basically uh, our in a wonderful, amazing um, writer producer Shawnee Isaac Smith, um, who really uh, is a visionary and was really 
moved by the story um, over and began documenting these incredible women, including Le Lenore and Anita Caspery and Helen Kelly and Pat mm -hmm. Reef, and mm -hmm. you know the list goes on. Uh, over 20 years ago, um, in the late 90s, early early 2000s, and um, at at a time when a lot of these extraordinary um, women were were alive and um, and she was able to do, conduct the, the interviews that you see in the film are actually uh, conducted by Shawnee um, and um, wow. and Shawnee uh, sends her best she wishes she could be with us this evening uh, um, but uh, hopefully another point um, but anyways it was Shawnee that really began um, this uh, whole process of telling the story um, in a documentary of the Immaculate Heart um, sisters and the Immaculate Heart community um, mm -hmm. and what happened um, was that it was you know, long and uh, it was a, many years uh, in, in assembling all these treasure troves, as I like to call them. Um, and then, you know, uh, around 2015, I um, was looking to bring on someone uh, to, to help bring this, uh, you know, to the world. And, um, and uh, through our uh, a mutual friend and, and colleague, Kira Carsonson, who's another producer on this project. Um, we, we were all connected and I, um, as, as someone who grew up Catholic and um, I was blown away and inspired by the story of these uh, extraordinary group and their imagination um, and really, you know, their call to be a part of the world. And a call to be um, to make a difference and to to really live uh, their faith in, in the way that you know their faith called them to and to um, empower um, each other, empower their students, and really sort of make a and make a, a a positive difference in the world. And for me, that was something that was extraordinary um, and so. Rev forward thinking uh, is, is something that uh, for me, I, uh, someone who has also in a very different way, but uh, felt the the institutional church uh, it, in, a, in a ways that um, maybe not the most positive ways. Um, mm -hmm. And also, but really being moved by the faith and what is being, you know, what, what the gospels are really calling mm -hmm. uh, us all to do in a certain way. So um, that was for me the, um, uh, I mean, it was in, you know, talk about love of first sight. I was, when I saw these ex extraordinary first accounts of, of these, uh, of these incredible women, I, I knew I had to help tell bring the story to 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 the world and to to light uh, in the you know in any way I could, and so I was honored that um, Shawnee and Kira um, you know brought me on board to to direct it. Thank you, thank you, and um, Lenore, I have a question for you as well. Um, so. I was very touched that 325 women were ready to be tossed out on the street uh, with no safety net um, because you of what you believed and because of the truth. I, and I, one thing that struck me at the very beginning of the film was the phrase about that somebody, I think it was one of the priests saying, well, they, they were moving out of safe Christianity. Well, I think safe Christianity is sort of an oxymoron. <laughs> and, but you guys, you did it, you know, and you took the ultimate risks. And I just wondered what that was like and how did you manage? I mean, were there Catholic, were there people that helped you financially? Was the Catholic community behind you? Can, can you reflect on that a little bit? Well, um, it was very difficult because we ranged in age from, you know, 20 to 70 or more. Mm -hmm. And um, through the years that we taught, we didn't have salaries. We had no pension, no savings account. We owned nothing. So when the time came to be independent, we had no roadmap to know what to do. And uh, several IHMs got together and lived in houses of 
five or six, pulled mm -hmm. together uh, money to buy a car or family gave cars. And we all had other friends and families um, help us how to learn to navigate in mm -hmm. the world outside the convent where we really depended on community for everything. Mm -hmm. So now um, we had to find jobs. I was teaching at the college and we continued for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But those who taught in the archdiocesan schools had to find other jobs. Um, and fortunately, the LAUSD Adult Education Department knew about Immaculate Heart nuns and people who were educated. Mm -hmm. So they offered jobs to many who uh, were formerly teachers in the diocese. Others went on to get training. So mm -hmm. um, law, social service, um, we were teachers and nurses. Mm -hmm. Those are the only choices. Mm -hmm. But given the opportunity to go on and get education, get further training, was um, opening the road that some had dreamed of but never thought they could achieve. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was financially difficult, and we had strong leadership who encouraged us to be hopeful, mm -hmm. um, who didn't know the road ahead either. So mm -hmm. I think the strength of community and friendship and faith guided mm. us on a journey that was totally unknown. Thank you. I also want to personally thank you on behalf of every other nun in the United States. I, I remember this well. My own suspicion is, is if you guys had not stood up, there would have been other bishops who would have done the same thing and tried to reverse some of the Vatican II reforms around habit and being able to choose our lifestyle. So you did, what you did was for the good of the church, as you said so well in the film. I have one other uh, question for you, Lenore, if I could. Um, so in making this film, what was it like for you to sort of relive those times? Um, did you come to any additional insights or observations beyond those that you had when you were living through it? You mean during the film, did I reflect Yeah, as you, on as you made the film, were you getting like, oh my gosh, I forgot about that part, it was horrible? I mean, were you getting any PTSD or anything? I don't know. No, there were things I had forgotten about. And even to myself, I hadn't seen or realized. Um, during the making of the film, all those years, I did support Shani. And oh, during okay. the film and seeing the film, gave me a deep sense of gratitude to Anita, Helen Kelly, Corita, whom I loved dearly and worked mm -hmm. with, and Pat Reeve. So their courage, their ability to articulate what we were going through was, was just marvelous and a miracle. So for, um, for the time that the film was being made, I just had deeper and deeper appreciation and gratitude and love for those whom I knew. I lived with them at the college um, and loved them dearly. Yeah, yeah, that's really, wow. Okay, um, back to Pedro. I, you were the editor. And one of the things I noticed, um, I loved the sort one, of- One of the editors. <laughs> one of the editors. Well, I was a sort of marginally involved with another film project at one point, and I know the editing is like so critical. And I love the graphics, the sort of the Corita-esque graphics that you wove through, showing Cardinal McIntyre with the red around his head all the time. And, and I really thought it helped connect um, the story. But I wonder, I mean, so what was it? What Was it difficult to edit to get the story together? Were there challenges and obstacles that you dealt with along the way? Well, I, I think that along with every every film, you know, comes with its own unique set of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in the way for this film, it turned out to be one of our sort of greatest opportunities to kind of think outside the box. You know, we had a saying at the, uh, after watching so much incredible material of 
uh, the Immaculate College and um, and Karita teaching, we were very inspired. Um, and we, one of the things that we had um, uh, amongst ourselves in in the edit room, we had the motto of "What would Karita do?" Um, <laughs> and that's sort of the code for think outside the box. You know, <laughs> right. question, you know like it's it's the, at the heart of the IHM to, to really think critically, to think beyond sort of the obvious answers mm -hmm. and to dig deeper. Um, and in a way we were sort of very um, inspired by her, her works and how they dialogued with um, what was going on in those days uh, mm -hmm. and, and during that time. And that was important to, um, for us to weave through throughout it to kind of show what sort of embodied um, another way visually what they were about and how it dialogued with everything that was going on and with their own story. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and building upon that, we're, you know, we said, well, actually for these uh, parts of the stories where we actually don't have much material how mm -hmm. can we tell that visually in a way that is engaging, that's captivating, mm -hmm. and captures the essence emotionally um, and feels organic to this? Mm -hmm. And it was a, well, well, what if we actually turn to animation <laughs> and try to embody, uh, be inspired by Karita's work and mm -hmm. art um, and process, actually, mm -hmm. you know, with the different layers? in bringing this to life in a new and mm -hmm. unique way. And um, our other extraordinary producer, Judy Corrin, um, uh, connected, uh, connected me with this uh, wonderful Icelandic animator called Una Lorentzen, um, mm -hmm. based in Montreal. And yeah, I mean, I, I have to say she was completely blown away by mm -hmm. Karita's work and on art and teachings. We mm -hmm. will have the, the, the rules of the class, Karita's mm -hmm. rules of the classroom in, you know, framed it on our walls. Mm -hmm. um, and really <laughs> kind of began to see, dig deep in each section of the story and how to bring that to life, you know, inspired mm -hmm. by, um, you know, and Karita and, and the, the IHMs themselves, you know, like, so it, that's- It really worked, I, I loved it. So I have one other question now for Lenore. Um, one of the things I couldn't help connecting with being a Catholic sister myself and having lived through the last 10 years um, was noticing, um, or I guess I want to ask, did you see any parallels with what you experienced with the apostolic visitation and the doctrinal assessment that the Vatican imposed on um, women's communities in the United States between 2009 and two, 2014? Do you have any reflections on that or you sort of like, I know it didn't affect you directly, but in some ways we're always sisters with one another. <laughs> and so I just wondered if you had any reflections about that because it, in some ways it, it was a parallel abuse of authority uh, similar to I believe what you all experienced. Well, I vaguely remember those times and I think I even wrote a letter if not to NCR, maybe to the LA Times. And I admired the nuns for their um, positive stance. It, it was mm -hmm. um, courageous, it was bold, it was hopeful, mm -hmm. it was spiritual. And I thought, um, you know, that's wonderful to at this time now be able to speak the truth to power. Mm -hmm and stand firm. I loved it and I loved the nuns and the communities that were um, courageous mm -hmm. and hopeful and mm -hmm. um, standing for what they really believed in. Speak mm -hmm. the truth to power really mm -hmm. enables one to um, keep going mm -hmm. in, with community, with the support of others. Mm -hmm. Well, you surely modeled that, I mean, for, for the rest of the country. I mean, in some ways, the the um, the comments from some of the priests were like, oh no, if they if they get away with this and all the other nuns are gonna do it. And it's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean, it, it I make light of it, but it is not a light thing to be able to be the author of your own destiny 
in a community of faith within a larger community of faith that is the church. So in many ways, this movement is something that animates and will create a better a better faith community um, in the long run, you know. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox here. Um, any other things that you'd like to share with, we've got about another minute left. Any other things that, I don't know, where's the film going? I mean, I know it's gonna be on Discovery Plus, is that right, Pedro? Any other things you wanna share with the group out here? That is correct. Um, the film is, we are very excited to uh, be partnering with Discovery Plus. Uh, they will be launching the film over the um, over the summer, and we'll have more news that coming up soon. Um, but I would say definitely follow us, um, RebelHeartsFilm.com, uh, mm -hmm. and you can get regular updates uh, on our release and and just and follow us on Twitter. Um, and uh, you know, we are really excited. And one of the things that I think. Uh, and, and I want, I would love for Lenore to have the, the last word, but for me, when I dove into this project, it was, yes, a lot of it takes place decades ago, but it is also really a film about today, you know, and about, mm -hmm. uh, it's a story about change mm -hmm. and it's about being a part of the world and what, you know, each of us are called to do and how we can empower one another mm -hmm. um, to do that. And, um, to as as Lenore said to to speak truth to power and um, and I think we you know it was kind of eerie editing being editing the film last year and kind of seeing that um, yeah the, the these larger movements and this greater awakening mm -hmm. take place and it felt so parallel it felt very much um, that I, I we were making a film about today and where we are now so mm -hmm. and it's about justice and the intersectionality so. I just had another question come up for Lenore. Could could you show that up again? My what advice thing? would you give young nuns okay. today? Oh, well, Lenore. Okay. What that question, question is for you? What advice would you give young nuns today? That's a question for you, Lenore. Um, be true to yourself. Follow the gospel, which is a higher call than hierarchy, and. Um, live the mission that your community is pledged to and be in community and with community. Love one another. And I, I want to thank, thank the team. We love you. You have done us uh, a wonderful, given us a wonderful gift. Mm -hmm. Well, right back at you. You've, you've given the, the most extraordinary gift. And uh, and greatest honor, one of the greatest honors of my life, Lenore. So um, it's been always always a joy. The, the moments like this, and he, you know, hearing Lenore and and t uh, connecting, you know, t telling their stories. I think this is a uh, um, it's really exciting for us, uh, the team, that this you know story is getting out there, and people are um, you know being inspired by them and uh, recognizing the the incredible pioneers uh, that they that they are and, and and so much that they give all of us. So thank you, Lenore. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been such an honor and so much fun. So hope I get to meet you in person sometime or see you. Likewise. Thank so, you. You're welcome. So I guess um, that I'll hand things back over to our host, Mallory, for the second part. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. That was such a delight and such a treat to have you moderate that conversation with both Pedro and Lenore. We're so thankful to not only have this film in our festival this year, but to have all of you be here for that conversation. It was really powerful. So I encourage everybody, um, hopefully if you're watching this, you've watched the film already. If you haven't though, um, go check it out. Um, we only have about half of the festival left to get all your films in. Um, and if you did watch the film, we encourage you to vote for it. Um, you can give this film a chance to win um, an award and, and a cash prize. Uh, you could vote through the CIF 45 streams platform. Just use the star rating system. Um, you can even if you've already watched it and, and forgot to vote, you can go back and, and still cast your vote. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's the a big difference uh, this year um, compared to last year when we were virtual. We weren't able to to have the voting for audience awards, which we were 
very sad um, that that was the case, but pivoting in three weeks um, was not enough time for us to be able to pull that off. But we're, that's why we're so thrilled to have the time to do that this year and make sure that we're giving um, as much uh, cash awards as we can to filmmakers this year. So please vote. We'll be announcing all of the award winners in our closing award ceremony, which will be this Saturday, April 17th, starting at nine o'clock Eastern, uh, directly following our closing night film and closing night film Q&A. You'll be able to get to our closing award ceremony, uh, which is hosted on our the SIF YouTube page uh, from our homepage. Uh, of the SIF site. So just go to clevelandfilm.org or go to the YouTube page if you're already following us and you'll be able to find that. It'll be free, open to the public. You don't need a ticket or anything to it, just like it was around the fountain at Tower City. Um, we'll be announcing all of the awards um, that night and then um, hopefully hosting a sort of impromptu Q&A um, with some of the award winners on Sunday, as many that we can pull together. So please come close out part of the festival uh, with us that night. But the great thing about uh, this year is that you'll have an additional three days um, after announcing our awards to keep watching films. Um, so after Saturday night, uh, you'll have Monday, or you'll have Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday uh, to catch up on films. And this is the first time ever that, you know, the festival is still happening after we've announced our award winners. So I think that'll be a great chance for, for people to catch um, some of the really great SIF favorites that you might have missed other way, otherwise. Um, so I, I apologize. I, I forgot to thank Karen Schiller, who's our next interpreter uh, for the night from Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center. Thank you so much for being here with us again tonight. Uh, we want to take a moment uh, as we transition into the second half of tonight's happy hour to thank all of our special guests and our audience for raising a glass with us tonight. In my case, a can of Great Lakes Brewing Company uh, Dortmunder, which is one of my favorite Great Lakes beers. Uh, we wouldn't be here without your ongoing support to bring film home, especially this year. Uh, please consider contributing to our challenge match to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we are so grateful for any amount that you're able to give. Um, we have a big year ahead of us. We've had two trying years um, uh, in 2020 and 2021, of course, not being able to be in person. Uh, but we have an incredibly challenging year this next year facing as well um, in finally moving to our permanent home, uh, Playhouse Square, which we are so excited to do. But it will be a lot of work for us to get there, and we really need your help to do that. So to, to help us out, please uh, donate uh, whatever amount you can is, is greatly appreciated. Just go to clevelandfilm.org slash donate and you can um, find all the ways to do so there. And now uh, we will head into tonight's segment uh, led by moderator Darian Michelle Gibson, Executive Director of SAG Indy. Hi Darian. Hi there, hello everyone. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to be here and to host uh, this SIF happy hour talk. Um, first of all, I'm happy to be in a happy hour anywhere, anytime. I have my cocktail. Um, but I'm particularly happy uh, to be talking to this filmmaker, Lisette Feliciano. She is an actress, a writer, a director, a <laughs> producer. I think there's some art department in that resume. Clearly a very talented woman um, who <laughs> is the writer and director of Women is Losers, a wonderful film. So welcome, Lisette. I'm so pleased to get to speak with you. Hello. Hi, Darian. Um, hi, other person. I don't know your name. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, we have a wonderful interpreter with us today. Um, nice to meet you. So I'm so excited to talk with you because I got a chance to see your film and was just blown away. I thought it was really wonderful. Um, but I have to say you tackled a lot of issues, a lot of ideas, um, mm. and really hit some very dramatic themes in a relatively mm. short amount of time, a little like a, an hour 20 or so. Um, mm. So I'd really love to hear how, what was the impetus for writing this film? Um, yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you to Mallory and Danielle for putting this together for uh, 
Cleveland International Film Festival. We're really excited to be here. We love this audience. Um, I personally have been following what you guys have been doing for pretty much my entire career. So it's, it's very special to be here. Um, the impetus for the film came from a conversation that I had with my mom who is the inspiration for the film. So she's very much the inspiration for Selena, who's our protagonist played brilliantly by Lorenzo Izzo from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And she, I, I, I was having trouble in my industry just sort of being taken seriously or, you know, I obviously had barriers to funding, just, just things that, um, I was, I was struggling with, and I grew up in an immigrant household raised by this woman that this movie is about. And she'd always told me, if you work hard, you keep your head down, don't complain, you know, rinse and repeat, you will achieve your dreams. And so that was the mandate leaving my home. And I sort of was doing all of that plus, and I wasn't very getting really far. Um, so it was a really humbling moment for me to come back to my mother and say, time out, something I don't, I'm doing everything and I don't want to come to you and complain, but I am also struggling and I don't think it has anything to do with my talent or what, you know, the things that you taught me. And she really had a moment where, with me where she sat me down and said, okay, this is what might be happening. This is what happened to me. And I had never known any of that, what she was saying. I didn't know any of it. I didn't know her story. I didn't know how hard she had worked to get, you know, make marginal gains in the real estate industry. I didn't know that some of the things that she'd gone through were legal at the time. They're no longer legal now on paper, but are still kind of happening, happening subliminally. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience. And I thought, wow, here's my superhero. And also, how did I not know this? And also, why is it still happening? So the film is very much that conversation with my mother. The, the fourth wall breaks are those moments where she kind of just gave me the unsaid truths um, out loud. And so when our characters break the fourth wall, but also break the fourth dimension, right? They leave the 60s and essentially come into 2021 and say, what's up, guys? <laughs> um, that's how the, the idea for the film, just really wanting to capture that feeling of what is happening and isn't this absurd <laughs> yeah i definitely got the feeling of uh the more things change the more they stay the same mm. um and having not grown up in an immigrant household but certainly in a household that recognizes the overt and um subvertive uh moments yeah it was an interesting thing and i loved the breaking of the fourth wall because those are the moments where your inner dialogue becomes mm -hmm. comes out, right? Even just in a look. There, I mean, there's so many times where a character would say something and the woman just looks at the camera and everybody, like I immediately went, mm -hmm, girl, I got it. <laughs> you know, there's that moment of like, Ugh. so it was really, I commend you in doing something that is such an interesting device that can be in, lesser hands, showy and gimmicky, mm. but instead was insightful and quietly a strength of the film. Um, it didn't Thank feel you. quirky. Uh, so yeah, it's a tremendous job. And I was very interested, with, how hard was it for you to decide to break the fourth wall? Was that always not, just like, let's just do it? <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of it was from the beginning of it. Um, I needed to give the audience context for like the context that I didn't have at the time. The fact that we couldn't own credit cards, the fact that, you know, maternity leave two months compared to what we have now compared to what we had before 1978, which was vacation of two weeks. Um, if that is, you know, it's, all, it's almost like it does. It's a world that I definitely was not educated on, but yet one that's so not far from, not very long ago. And so, yeah, I mean, I know, right? Like the fourth walls are, it, it's, it's, um, it could not work. But I also, everybody that came to the story had a version of this story in them already around other representation or, or something that they'd been through. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of in this film is that there is a multicultural experience. There is an intersectionality 
um, because that's just very natural to who I am and to the world that I exist in. Um, but the fourth wall breaks in particular for me, and I believe what I would try to empower the cast to do is to just say what they wanted to say in that world. It's like so many times we are subtly dealing with microaggressions, right? And with the brave face that we have to put on in order to survive and thrive in some of these environments is, is quite traumatizing, um, can be quite traumatizing, it seems. So that fourth wall break for me is saying my experience, right? Saying how I experience this this world, um, how we experience this world as either people of color or, or, or women or wherever it is that you're finding your yourself in this story. Um, it's not a trauma drama, right? It's not a story about, look at all the horrible things that happened, isn't it horrible? That's not my interest, that's not my feeling. My community is very positive and very joyful and they make the best out of nothing. And I was not going to let them be victimized. So when we break the fourth wall, we are owning our experience and speaking to it. I mean, I love it because break, at those moments where you break the fourth wall, it's a relief because you can actually say what you think instead of having the, the plastered smile on your face while you're mm. thinking in your head, how horrible is this? It is a relief mm. to see somebody just be able to acknowledge it. Even if it's just a sly to the camera, you know, we understand. And it just it's just letting out a little bit of steam that you're feeling inside, you know, yeah, just to actually, release it before it explodes. <laughs> to your point about the slide, there were some in the, in the script that didn't make it into the cut, but there were some that weren't in the script that when we were in the situation, for example, Liza Wheel, who um, plays Minerva for, and you know everybody knows her from Gilmore Girls, but I know her from Women as Losers. Um, we were in the scene with Simu Lu, fantastic. He's about to be Shang-Chi in Marvel. You guys have to know him. He's incredible Huge. as a person on top of everything else. He's just one of the most empowering people around representation, I think working today. Um, and we were in this scene and it just felt like, a it just felt right. I said, Liza, just look up. And she, and she was like, oh, you're right. So then we did the scene and then she looked up and that it was one take and it just worked, right? It just felt right. Um, so that's one of my favorite. That's honestly one of my favorite fourth wall breaks, but it was not in the script. It just kind of happened on set. So yeah, little tidbit yeah, there. <laughs> I like that one as well. Um, yeah. So let's talk about your cast because your cast is amazing. So how did you go mm -hmm. about getting them? And, and did you use a casting director and how did you go about that process? Yeah, so actually Claire Kuntz um, was my casting director. She's incredible. She's very plugged into feelings and how a story should feel um, versus like who's gonna sell, which is kind of sometimes the, the balance that we have to do. Like, um, and that was really important to me, especially for the first one, like this, this has to feel right. So, um, you know, we did a really extensive search for Selena and then we, um, Lorenzo was actually not available when we were going to shoot the film. And then we delayed a little bit and then she became available again. And when we sat down and had lunch, it was just love at first sight. Like our conversations were not even really about the script. It was more about how we grew up, which was very similar. Like our core values, very similar. Um, a lot of the casting that I try to do is I'll try to watch interviews. I'll try to watch short films. If people have done short films at the start of their career, I'll try to watch that to try to get like the most authentic version of what, what was happening before, you know, they've gotten to this stage. Um, so that's how Lorenza came on. And then of course she came on as an executive producer because she felt so, um, she felt a deep connection to, to the story, which for me was very humbling, you know, because a lot of the times you feel like you're isolated and you're going through this stuff alone. And what I've learned on this project is that Unfortunately, my experience isn't that special. So many people do feel this way. Um, and talking about it actually connected me to a lot of people that I don't think I would have had otherwise. So yeah, Lorenza came on as an executive producer and it was wonderful to have her just like as a balance board too, because sometimes you know we walk into these spaces and we're the only in the room. And that's very heavy because you don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Um, I, I, I hope I have one answer ever. So <laughs> being able to just check with her and say, 
you know, does this does this feel right? You know, that was that was really great. And then so Chrissy Fit came in. I had seen her in Pitch Perfect, and these are all very comedic roles. She'd done a lot of comedic roles, but um, there's there's like there was drama in her eyes, even in those com comedic spaces. Um, so I was like, I'm interested in that. I want to see if we can pull that. And she obviously gave a, an amazing performance. And then with Simu, <laughs> it was funny. Um, that character was originally much older, um, but Simu came in and read. And again, the character was older, so I wasn't sure if it was going to work. Um, but then I saw him in Kim's Convenience. I came home and I saw him in Kim's Convenience and there's a scene with him and his father, I think named Appa. And Kim's Convenience is, you know, a fantastic show, but it's a sitcom, right? It's, it's supposed to be comedy. There's a scene with him and his father um, and it's so charged and so heavy and so painful. And you can see the generational like struggles between those and I said, okay, well, that's, that's what I need. So I've got him on soon after that. And then Brian Craig, I'll stop after this, but Brian Craig <laughs> um, came onto the show three days before we shot. Wow. His first scene is the opening scene. And he was off book within a night, which is just beyond like technique. It's like beyond technique. And, you know, his, his role was really tough. I said, look, I, we, I, I need help challenging preconceived notions of masculinity and, and watching somebody go through that process of unlearning something that they think is what makes their identity. And, I mean, you saw what he did. He just kind of like went and swam with it um, in the best way possible. So it was a real good, it was a collaboration because we're all peers on top of that. So it was a real, really a great collaboration. Was Sumo's character, even though it was older, was it, was he still Chinese? Yes, always. Interesting. Um, okay. and, but you have to, you have to talk a little bit about Stephen Bauer. I mean, that was like, <gasps> Oh wow. my goodness, Stephen Bauer. I'm sorry, I wanted to, but I was just like, I feel like I've just been talking for, I mean, I can talk about my cast all day, every day. Like, wait till I tell you about Cranston Johnson who showed up and just was like, <laughs> brought us all back into like, oh, this is art, okay. You know, <laughs> he just came in as like a breath of fresh air. Um, oh my goodness, Stephen Bauer, what, do you, what can I say about it? He's like, he's, he's a legend, he's a legend. Um, and we were actually shooting in the Mission District, which is a very, you know, um, Central American, South American, Mexican community. And the second Stephen Bauer showed up, we got so much extra love from the community because everybody knew him, right? They're like, oh my God, Stephen Bauer's here. It's fantastic. And, and, you know, to his, to his, you know, to his credit, it's like, it's, it's a tough role because it, it can be a very stereotypical role, but the, what we wanted to do with that was turn that stereotype on its head and really like have a conversation about deep wounds, right? And and masks and, and you know, when he has his breakdown, right? It doesn't redeem what he's done, but you do see that there's a human under that. And it, the softness that he brought to that, even though, you know, Stephen Bauer's a presence. He walks on the set, you know, he's there. <laughs> you know, he's was six, five, I'm five, two. It was very fun. It was a fun experience. Um, but yeah, he just, he's one of the greats. He's one of the greats for sure. It was such an, for all of us, especially Lorenzo, myself, Brian, Chrissy, you know, we're from this community in so many ways we're here because of him. Mm -hmm. um, and I made sure to let him know that. I think we all made sure to let him know that. Um, because my God, it's just, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It was, it was weird. It was really cool. It was really cool. I mean, Alejandra Miranda also, she's a legend as well, you know, in, in Colombia. And, um, yeah, well, I liked the fact that we had lots of different generations in the story. That was important to me too. Like a lot of the times we see these movies and it's like either just 20 year olds or either just, you know, six year olds. And, Again, it's more natural for me to have different generations in different cultures. And it does speak to generational trauma in that yeah, from absolutely. the father to the daughter. And then she says, how will my son remember these days? How will he evolve? I mean, it was such a, a, a good way of explaining how, you know, nothing happens on one plane. Like it, it trickles down, it pours into the next group. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Thank I was, you. It was wonderful to see Stephen Bauer though, because I just thought, oh, to have that kind of gruffness, but still show such vulnerability mm -hmm. and pain and disappointment and all mm -hmm. of that. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it was it was great, but it actually led into my like next question because I was very impressed by your locations and yeah. the, the the character of the city and mm. your ability to kind of incorporate. I mean, like any one of those sets from the bank, the offices, the home, the, I thought is a is a, a I was going to say chore, but it's not a chore, but it's a difficulty for an in you know for an indie film, and then but you did so well. Was it just Steve, send Stephen Bauer first and then get a bank? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually Stephen came on as we were filming. So we were already up and running and then he came on. Um, thank you about the generational, um, the, the noting the generational like traumas. I think that was definitely important, right? We, her mother, her, uh, Stephen's character is a mirror for Brian's character and, and little Lincoln is a mirror for, Brian's character as well, you know, uh, and you know, even when Selena says to her son, how do I keep you from turning into one? I think she's definitely, when she says, how do I keep you from turning into essentially the men that have hurt me so much? Um, I think she's acknowledging in that space that yes, what I do now is going to create this later, right? And so that was important to me because again, back to the conversation with my mother, it was her generation and mine and we were, dealing with similar things. And I don't think that's by accident. Right. So that was uh, that with, and with, it actually plays into the mission district, right? The mission district has been the mission district for a while now, even, even as it is now, things have changed, but there's still a heart there. There's still, the people are still there. And so I really wanted to shoot in the mission district because it's not often that you see a movie from San Francisco that isn't financial district or, you know, the cable cars and the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's a very specific San Francisco to a very specific socioeconomic group. But yeah. the socioeconomic group that I grew up in, grew up in, we had the Mission District, we had Petrero, we had, um, you know, Chinatown, right? The, his, the rich history of Chinatown, how um, they were segregated to this this amount of blocks of, of things. And instead of feeling sorry for themselves, they made alleyways behind to add more streets, right? That ingen that, ingen that ingenuity, that 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 like that making do with what you have, right? That came. That's the immigrant community in San Francisco, and it doesn't get shown as often, um, at, or at all. <laughs> I struggle, right? That's what we say in the beginning of the movie. Most of the films from the 60s and 70s don't cover us and it almost feels like people of color didn't exist back then a little bit right so that's why i want it was really important for me to shoot in the mission district like that high school is my high school um that bodega is my bodega um and there was a chargedness to that to having these spaces and it was really hard because it's a period piece right no one told no one said i could do a period piece probably ever in my career let alone for my first film you know, I got the, I'm sure what a lot of filmmakers get here, you know, get, we have heard probably in your audience is like, make your first movie in one room. And if that's what's in your heart, go do it. But if someone is asking you to play small, yeah, maybe don't, you know? So, um, so yeah, I wanted to do a period piece, a period piece and this was the only way I could do it. And it kind of worked because they're supposed to be like the, the, in 1967 to 2021, right to present day. So we have these characters in the 60s and 70s. They're walking around in 2021. Like that's the message essentially of the film. So it works visually. It also works budgetarily, and it works for the movie. I do think that there is a tendency. I mean, first when you're first starting out for everyone, but in particular, women who come out of film programs to not swing big. And it's an interesting phenomenon that it, it does tend to be like, I think it's everybody gets to kind of do something small, build your way up. But I find that women in particular, women creators in particular are, are kept there. And it's, you know, tiny <laughs> steps, 10 more dollars. What will she do with it? And I find it so Yay. interesting. I mean, look at the budgets, man. It, not even just in the indie world. Like it's it's comical the 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 how small the budgets are at every stage, if a female's helming or not. Like it's it's yeah. really it's really to the point where like even in the indie space, 
you know, the guys are coming out with their 750 plus and the girls are coming out with their 200, 250 at best. Right. Um, and that's definitely something that I've kind of been like, hey, guys, what's up? Um, it's an that, interesting thing, don't you think? Because women traditionally have been the keepers of budgets and <laughs> you know, running, running households, et cetera. But suddenly, you know, if you, if you start it $200,000 film, it's like, well, if we give her $2 million, what will she do? She'll spend two hundred fifty on her film and the rest on shoes and purses? Like, I don't understand what where that disconnect comes. I'll let you know on my next one. I mean, honestly, I, I try to tell people, look what I did with nothing. Like, please give me a budget. Please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, my God. Um but I mean, it also goes back to the movie, right? She's trying to create financial independence for herself. She's trying to make money and she has barriers to that. And it's a very American, you know, a, a very American thing to want to prosper and to want to be able to have agency over your ability to prosper. Um, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, was, was ingrained in me and my community, like make your own money and be independent. And, it, you know, I think it seems like as the wealth in our country shifts, as more and more women accumulate wealth and accumulate a decent amount of wealth where they have the ability to not only survive, but thrive and also, you know, have others thrive, maybe things will start changing. But it, it really just, my mother always told me that it's, it comes down to economics um, down the line <laughs> across the board. I mean, even in the medical field, why are, you know, why, why can't they figure out some really easy stuff? Seems like. Yeah. I mean, you know, equal pay seems like it should be a no brainer. Same job, same pay, but yeah. I mean, I'm just going to go and say it's not even the same job. I have never been in a situation where a woman is not doing her job plus everybody else's. So, um, yes. You're absolutely yes. right. Don't pay more. <laughs> and and making everyone feel better about themselves for doing this. Like, no, no, that's great. I'm happy to but do it all. Right. We're it's progress. We are in, the, in in more progress for sure. I think we're definitely more and more progress. And it's what we're seeing. I feel like what we're seeing, and I think hopefully what the movie does is is just allow that conversation and allow people to kind of reflect within themselves without feeling judged, right? Because if you kind of zoom out of the slogans and zoom out of like everything, it's a bit ridiculous. Like if you look at like the world that we're still kind of like defending and things like that, it's, it's kind of absurd. Um, and we can fix everything. Does seem like we just we just put a vaccine together within like six months. We can do it. Do we want to is the question. Yeah, priorities. Um, and it's, you know, what I love, though, is that you are saying very forcefully, showing very forcefully the issues that mm -hmm. are still so prevalent. And yet you manage to do it in a way that is still entertaining and interesting and doesn't feel like, you know, a... It, it, it's not preachy. It's not like you're going to sit here and spend an hour and a half while I tell you everything that's wrong <laughs> with the world. You know, like, oh. but it's just like really fantastic. I, I wanted to ask Thank you about you. the title. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please explain the title for us. Thank you. And thank you for saying it's entertaining. Like, look, I'm an artist. I'm not a politician. I didn't even try to make a political film. I just put people in a place where obviously they were going to come up against, just by virtue of who they are, things that were in the political spectrum, right? Um, but yeah, my entire thing is entertain first because that's what we're doing. You know, I'm not a politician. I'm, a, I'm an entertainer. And I don't have answers. I just have mirrors. That's all I got. Um, so I'm using them. But yeah, the title, back to the generational thing that you and I were talking about, I had been, you know, I was researching the time period and I wanted to have female voices from music because music's important to me and my family. Um, there's me, my father's a musician and I grew up with music, Oye Como Va, which I got into the movie somehow by some miracle, Lord. Um, <laughs> it was a song that I grew up with. So, um, and I dance, so all of that stuff. But I wanted musicians female musicians at the time. And of course, uh, you can't you can't like hit a rock without talking about Janis Joplin. 
Um, but I'd actually never listened to her before this, which is funny. Yeah. She had always been presented to me as a feminist icon, right? But there was a song in her first album with Big Brother and the Holding Bam, or one of her first albums, called Women is Losers. And I was all up in arms. What is she saying? What does she mean? She's supposed to be a feminist. Blah, blah, blah. Like I had all the emotions that I'm sure people have when they see my title. Um, so, but I, it made me press click. It made me press play. So I pressed play, which is I hope what people are doing with my movie. Uh, it made me press play. And when I listened to the song, I was, it was, it was almost like that conversation with mom again. Here was this feminist icon saying in a song, why do women always end up on the bottom? Isn't this absurd? Yeah. That's essentially the song. And I just thought, yeah, man, you're right. And the way she writes it, women is losers. It's, it's, it's a joke. It's making fun of it, right? It's making fun of in that humor that I wanted to instill in the movie. So I, I mean, I stuck the title on it and somehow it has not been yet, somehow. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but I mean, it, it was such a, it, it really is a, uh, it's notable, not just for Janet Jackson, but the cadence of it and how it relates. It, it makes a great sense. Thank um, you. I want to ask you maybe the worst question to ask somebody who has just finished this momentous. What am I doing next? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going yeah. to make it easier Do on it. you and say, what is your next, like, dream film like what what would you make if you had all the money that the you needed oh what uh various things um various things i'm very prepared i have a whole roster of things nice. um that i've As been waiting should. waiting for just just you wait um anywhere where i can have an impact you know i think right now um yeah, right now it's anywhere where we can have an impact, anywhere where there's a there's a, a bigger pond for us, the people that were on this film to play in. Um, you know, I'm actually really, really inspired by what the Marvel Universe is doing within re their representation slate. Um, and I would be so humbled to have a conversation there. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, for me, it's uh, our stories are mainstream. Um, is what I, I think. I think they're all mainstream, right? It's all the same story. Like we're all just Americans at the end of the day. So whether you're, you know, with, it, it's, it's, a main, it, it's a mainstream. I, I'm going to go into the mainstream is what I'm trying to say. Um, I'd love to do studio movies. I, you know, I, I still want to do, I obviously have my, my indie darling baby that I've been nurturing for a very long time, but I don't know if that'll be the next one. I think that'll be in a couple of years. Um, but yeah. I think definitely I'd like to have a conversation with the cinematic universes. Um, I love that. There's a television conversation, of course, of, of course. course. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that there, you know, there's this misconception or at least it's been verbalized, shockingly verbalized misconception that like when women in indie come bring out a film that their only interest is staying indie and that we're not interested in, you know, shooting dinosaurs or other planets and, you know, going big. And I, oh so my I, God. I love that you're like, no, give me Marvel. Like, let me put let me, take me a in world. space. I want space. I want a different world. I want sci-fi. I want big worlds. Like some of my favorite things are big world building pieces. Um, and even this movie, it's small, but it's a world, right? It's a it's period a piece. It's a period piece, like <laughs> like it's 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 its own world. Um, so yeah, I like world building. I like big things. I like things where we can have, you know, conversations with like big concepts. Um, I think big concept pieces are are really are um, some of the things that I've grew up watching and loving. And and yeah, <laughs> like point me in the direction of that world, and I'm there. I think it's fantastic. I can't wait to see you uh, build a world that I can have the privilege of watching. It's been oh my uh, fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. The great questions, by the way, really, really great questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I think we are just about out of time. 
Um, so I really want to thank you for joining in. I mean, it's always nice to have filmmakers come in and talk about their work and for joining us in your wonderful film, which I tell everybody, please go be sure to watch it. Women is Losers. Thank you, Janice Joplin, for that. Um, thank you, by Janice. the way, the, the English part of that is just like, ugh, ugh, ugh. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. But it's, but it's worth it. Yeah. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us for tonight's happy hour. Uh, I want to give a particular thanks to the Great Lakes Brewing Company for sponsoring this happy hour. Uh, and I want to tell you all to tune in tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, for another live SIF 45 streams happy hour. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep watching films. Thank you, everyone.